the two-third general rule wave has been sweeping across the country, amassing with it mixed opinions uh, across uh, various places. We have seen a section of Kenyans saying it is about time and the implementation of that particular rule has been long overdue, while some have been saying that uh, Kenya is not yet there in terms of attaining uh, gender parity and ensuring that uh, the two-third gender rule is implemented to the fullest. We spoke to some residents of Kisumu and here are their opinions. Ningependa ku encourage wanawake wajitokeze. Kama wanaweza kusimamia hata viti zingine za county ama za region ama za nation wasimamie tuone vile tunaweza saidiana kwa sababu wamama mara mingi ndio wana, wanajenga nchi. Wamama wajitokeze kwa wingi pia wakuje wapiganie hiyo kiti viti zote kama ni governor kama ni senate hata kwa parliament hata kwa MCAs wote wa mama wajitokeze tunaunga mkono maraga kile amesema ni cha maana but as women we need to stand out well and go for those positions as well as maraga is right women have not have not stood well to go for the positions wa mama wanasema they are equal to men isn't it sasa iko mahali wanataka wape in silver plate wangangane Eh, hey, wangangane wakuje tu kwa field tungangane tu, akipata ni sawa akikosa ni sawa sasa hiyo maneno ya hiyo gender equality warekebise walete kwa referendum tutoe hiyo kila mtu angangane very strong sentiments from residents of Kisumu. Now we're waiting to see which direction the country will take, whether it will be looking to review the constitution and scrap off the two-third gender rule, or it will be looking to empower women to ensure that women squat out uh, uh, with their male counterparts during elections to ensure that parliament and all other spaces of leadership have observed the two-third gender rule as enshrined in the constitution. Thanks, Laura. That's Laura Otieno speaking to Kisumu residents there, finding out what their thoughts are in terms of the dissolution of parliament puzzle. Honorable Chris Omalo is still with me, member of parliament for Kiminini. Joy Mudivo is also with me, former magistrate, and Steve Ogola, advocate of the High Court. Honorable Omalo, I'll start with you. Is there a way of sneaking in a referendum if the president hypothetically decides to dissolve parliament so that when people are going to the polls, then there's a referendum question as well? Uh, now, we need to understand the process of uh, the popular initiative. It cannot succeed without parliament. If parliament is dissolved for whatever reasons, that means that is the end of the BBI. Okay? And as we speak right now, uh, last week we raised this matter on the floor of the House. We don't have in the BBI report. We don't know what were the issues, what are going to be the critical issues that are going to seek for, for, for constitutional amendment. When you read Article 255 of the Constitution, it's very clear. And it stipulates what are the issues that will require a referendum and what are the issues that can be done through a popular initiative. For instance, if we are, in my own uh, judgment or in my own opinion, if we are to delete the requirement of the two third gender, I'm not very sure whether we need a. Uh, we need, we need a referendum initiative. You need a referendum. And as I speak right now, on the debate, you know, that is subject to debate. It depends on how your interpretation is. But we've looked at it as parliament, and you've seen it can as well be done through a popular initiative. That is a debate for another day. So, Trevor, for me, I think uh, I'll request the committee that was on BBI to release this report to His Excellency the President so that you can be able to look at the issues and see which are these critical issues that have been flagged out, so that we'll be able to know, do we need to correct them through, are they going to be corrected through the referendum or through the parliamentary initiative? And parliament is there so that you can be able to do this before 2022. And my humble request, I know Justice is going to look into this matter. Parliament, the 12th parliament, cannot be dissolved unless there's a the declaratory order which has not been issued. And I agree with my other colleague who mentioned that the Chief Justice should have issued that order to dissolve Parliament, that, that, not this 12th Parliament. This 12th Parliament is there legally. It is there going to do its work up to 2022. And His Excellency President, whatever he is, please, if it's dissolved Parliament, wait until 2022.
Let's wait for the BBI report <laughs> yeah. so that we can move on and amend this constitution accordingly. Okay. Ugola, given the status quo, is it even possible for the court to rule on this 12th, uh, 12th parliament, give them 60 days to implement, and then the chief justice to write another advisory to the president? Is that likely to happen, or is this now a done deal? Because also considering he's, uh, he has limited time as well. The court will only become, uh, the, the matters pending before the court will only be rendered negatory if the president dissolves parliament abruptly. But as long as parliament yeah. exists, the petitions pending before the courts, before Justice Correa, there are two petitions pending before Justice Correa. Petition number 397 of 2017 and petition number 401 of 2017, which will be heard simultaneously. They will be determined on merit and based on the prayers that those petitions, that the petitioners are asking. If they are merited, the High Court will pronounce itself. It does not affect, the Chief Justice Directive does not affect the trajectory those cases will take. So what I see is this. There is a very high likelihood that the High Court sitting at Nairobi will direct this parliament to enact the law within new timelines. Let's say 60 days. And I can tell you, Trevor, mm -hmm. what I like with the Chief Justice uh, sudden move it now adds political pressure on the president and parliament that now they are more likely, it's like preparing the way for the judgment that you're anticipating from Justice Correa. Parliament now know that it is true the chief justice can actually petition, can actually advise for dissolution. You know, we have some provisions in the constitution which we never imagined can actually be triggered. But I do not. What I see now as value addition is that Parliament now is aware that if they don't pass this law, if there, were, there was an order, the Chief Justice may issue a second advisory, and then the President now will not have legal room. So this is a temporary reprieve that the 12th Parliament is enjoying. That's because of the urgency now that we have. I'm also happy that Justice Correa will render his judgment in the shortest time possible. I can say that maybe by looking at the other trend, where courts give parties up to 30 days to get a judgment, if we go for the hearing on 7th of October, it is possible that by end of October, we will have a new judgment on the matter. And the Chief Justice will issue another advisory, and Parliament might go home by November, the right way. So I think the political <laughs> pressure is and, and this is what I see as benefit. So, but in terms of altering the landscape as it is right now, no. The, the, the short answer is no, Trevor. Okay. Joy, what do you make of this? Does the advice of the Chief Justice then even cast a bit of doubt on the validity of the decisions and proceedings of Parliament going forward, even if the, the President doesn't decide now? Is there a bit of doubt of whether the validity of their proceedings are there or not? No, like I said earlier, until a declaration otherwise, Parliament is on seat properly. And so right now they're actually carrying out their mandate as given in the Constitution because the elected officials and they'll carry on doing so until something happens otherwise. And I like what Steve has said because what I understand now is that Parliament that this is what awaits you if this happens. And the fact that um, there is actually time, you know the previous decision came when there was actually no time. So the decision was an excellent decision. But the timing was such that it was timely. This judgment, if it comes out, is going to be in good time. Now, the laws of, of uh, precedent mean that previous courts have decided in a certain way. So Judge Corey is unlikely to steer very far away from what is there, because it's a black letter of the law. There's very little to interpret or to to, to maneuver. So if I was in, in the National Assembly right now, we would be creating markers coming up with a new bill and trying to beat the penguin. So that by the time that Gorilla is issuing his judgment, the matter is already time bad because, look, we already have a law that is talking about how the National Assembly can attain the gender rule. Now, the homework now is left to the 12th Parliament to redeem themselves, because in this particular instance, if the decision comes and the, advice, and the chief justice is, is still on seat, 
he is a fresh advisory. He's already shown his willingness and his eagerness to do the thing. So as much as the parliamentarians may may not be too comfortable with that possibility, it is an opportunity for them because they've been given a snapshot into the future. And if they don't do anything about it, short of um, the president now, now pulling now. the trigger on them, I don't see them. I don't see them escaping from actually getting to a place where they discuss a bill, they table a bill, discuss it, and pass it. And if they can do it in record time, the better. Because why wait until you're given a, a deadline and then you defeat it again? So this is the time when they need to call the leader, yeah. not just the women, but call or even FIDA and the others who are interested in this process. The women caucus, the, uh, the Kenya political women caucus, had several suggestions on how this gender rule can be achieved. It's time to look at those formulas again because it is possible to attain an elective gender parity formula. It is very possible. If we've done it in the county assemblies and we've uh, done it Trevor, in the assemblies, okay. we can do it in the national assembly. All right. Honorable Trevor, Malo, yes, go ahead. Uh, one thing I want to put across is for members to beware yeah. that parliament, particularly the parliamentary male, male members of parliament, they've been on the front line supporting uh, this bill. First and foremost, ask yourself, who has been sponsoring this bill? It's been Duale. Duale is a male, he's not a female. Myself, as a person, I've been on the front line supporting this two-third gender rule. And as we speak right now, we have a bill in the Senate on the two-third gender. And as Justice Corrine rules, whatever the case, he must be aware that when it comes to these constitutional bills, when it comes to second reading, there's mandatory of the 90 days. It's not like any other ordinary bill. So if they are give, uh, to give a time frame to parliament, it should not be less than two months or three months. It should be something to do with the, with the six months, and parliament will pronounce itself. We are there to legislate. We are not shying away. And I have no doubt that uh, with given opportunity, obviously, parliament will do its work. But remember, we are at the corona time. Parliament in line with the Minister of Health protocols, the guidelines. We are only sitting twice. So you must put into consideration. National Assembly is very busy. Right now, as we speak, you saw the bill coming from the, the count sharing uh, formula, which you have to look into. So parliament is very busy. So as Justice Corrill hears next week, that's on 7th, if he makes a, a determination or a judgment, let's say uh, maybe somewhere one month from now, it should be COVID-19, so that whatever time frame is going to give Parliament should be enough time and bearing in mind that we're only sitting twice per week because of this next year, mid next year or so, I think Parliament should be able to, to pronounce itself on this bill. Okay. Steve Ogol, I'll give you a chance to give your closing remarks on this conversation because I know you have a court session coming up. Then I will release you and listen to what the people have to say on the ground. We're going to the ground in Eldred with the Wanyama. Steve. So Trevor... For clarity and for the avoidance of doubt, the Chief Justice Directive to the President will be reversed by the High Court for confusing the law on dissolution, but that is a temporary reprieve. That order will be reinstated by Justice Correa, and a new timeline will be given to Parliament. The second thing is, what I like as political dividend from the CJ's action is that now it piles political pressure on the president and the National Assembly. They are now more likely to pass this law than ever. Parliament has not been fully committed in passing this law. If you look at the security amendment law, and if you look at the finance bill, where Parliament needs the numbers, they always get the numbers. They have never prioritized the gender legislation as directed by the courts. But now, there is a real chance that we might go to the next election with this law in place. So that is, for me, what I consider as a big win. The Constitution demands political will in its implementation. Political will has been lacking in the National Assembly since 2013, up to now. But right now, because the president needs this parliament, to pass the BBI type of legislation, and because the president does not want to be seen as disregarding the advice of the CJ, remember, Trevor, only the lawyers can explain the intricate issues around interpretation of the CJ. The Wanjiko on the ground just know that the, uh, the CJ has said, 
parliament is unconstitutional, parliament needs to be dissolved. And that is final. So political dividend will emerge from that statement and from this crisis. Let us hope that we don't lose the momentum. Let us pass the bill that is in the Senate. Let us bring this opportunity to close this two-third gender bill once and for all. Okay. Let's bring in uh, what the people are saying from uh, Eldred and uh, Steve Ogola will be heading to court after this. This is what they had to say to John Wanyama from Eldred. The question whether President Uhuru Kenyatta should dissolve the national parliament or not has sparked mixed reactions among East Kenyans, especially here in Eldoret, where many are feeling like it is time for the president to dissolve the parliament so that MPs can go back to their respective constituencies for re-election. Uh, Mwashimua rais atachukua muda gani kuifunja au kukosa kuifunja. Na ikifunjwa, tutachukua muda gani kuenda upande wa uchagusi. Na elawa ni nime, tatu au 90 days. Nae sasa kuna kisungi mkuti ingine hapa. Kuna semekana kuna BBI. Sasa statujui kama ni BBI itaanza au ni manena ya kufunji ya bunge. Bunge ikifunjwa wakati huu, itamanisha program zote na ile project zote siku njiani sitasambaratishwa. So hiyo, misi yone kama maoni, maoni ya maraka ni sawa, kisheria. Lakini ikifunjwa saa hii, alafu wachakua watu wengine, sioni kama hata patu hiyo two thirds tatapatakana. Hata wamama wala wako tayari saa hii, wengine wawo watafukuzwa na wata rudi, na itamanisha namba ilapta itatitimia, batale ya kuenda juu. Lakini president, atakuwa na kulingana hiyo maoni ako na ako na nafasi ya kuona ni wakati gani atafunja na mimi najua hata akifunja 2022 bado hiyo ni kufunja bunge si lazima iwe wakati huu kama sheria ilisemekana ya kwamba itatu fulani ya kina mama wanastahili kwa funge ama wapewe pio na sheria na haijafanywa inamaanisha kuwa tumeshindwa na kasi Election, you don't have money. Eh? ABC, they are not well prepared. How will we be in uh, hmm? health the election? So it will cost us a lot of money. So we are not ready for that, for sure. Yeah. At one mahana, Bunga Kikai, Nasis to Naomi. Sababu hivi kama hata president mwenye ikuwate sharia, siya batali tubunje bunge. Bunje bunje, hata kama nileo. Ile jambo maraka alifanya, alifuata sharia. Alifuata constitution yetu article 261, inampea ruza. Kwa sababu tunashanga, tangu constitution ni pitishwe, ikuwe promulgated 2010. Tuluka tumepewa furza ama chance ya five years, iweze kupitishwe hiyo tuta. Lakini mpaka saa hii tunaona ijawahi tendeka hivyo. That's why tuliona kama bunge sasa ni kama wame, wame shindwa na kazi. So according to me, bunge ifunjwe, wabunge wakuja nyumbani, wanainji wajakua bunge wengine. Gender rule is very important. If they defy, wakuja nyumbani, tuwanze wengine, fresh. Kwa sababu, in fact, Kenya size maliko. Viongozi wanafunja sheria. Wanaambia sisi sasa zingine hata kufaa mask. Na hao wenye wafai, hata mimi mwesi wesi faa. Kwa sababu, Ruta ajafa, president ajafa, raila ajafa, ile shilingi ya msini yangu ya maski, hili ni unuwe mboga, ama nipitia kama transport. Mina ataka bunge ifunjwe, alafu wawa watu waende warudi upia. Wakiwa watu ambao wamechaguliwa, wame wa, waende wakijua ni nini wanaenda kufanya pale. There you have it, and most Kenyans as they continue to mount pressure on President Uhuru Kenyatta to dissolve the National Assembly, more questions are now arising whether President Uhuru Kenyatta's legacy will be achieved if he dissolve or if he will not dissolve the National Assembly. Another thing residents are asking is when the president is supposed to dissolve the National Parliament after he has been advised by the CJ, where they are saying it is not clear, the Constitution is not really giving a particular aggressive period when the president is supposed to be dissolving the National Parliament. From Wasingishu, back to your studio. Well, thanks, John. That's John Wanyama speaking to us live from Eldoret there. And Honorable Wamalwa, there's a, a 
text here from uh, Honorable Moses Kuri, a Gatundu South Member of Parliament. He tells me that Chris knows we will never pass this bill. It is unworkable. He says, which constituencies will be for men? Why increase the seats to 650 on gender only? And why should constitution force me to vote yes? Uh, that is uh, Honorable Moses Kuria's uh, opinion. No, no, come on. Yes. And, and, and I've been on record, as I said earlier, I've been supporting the two-third gender. So I don't want to discuss uh, Honorable Moses uh, Kuria's uh, opinion because uh, I'm, not, I'm not Moses Kuria. But one thing I want to correct when uh, is it Steve? Steve mentioned about the issue of finance bills, that when finance bills, there's always quorum, we normally pass. I want to correct him and say that finance bills are not like these constitutional bills where it requires uh, the, the supermajority. Before, before a division or anything, the speaker must ascertain that we have a minimum of about, let's say, 233 members. And that is a requirement as far as the constitutional bill is concerned. When it comes to these finance bills, so long as there's quorum, and in parliament quorum has been 50, so long as there's quorum, parliament can be able to transact. But when it comes to uh, the constitutional bills like this two-third gender, we must have the supermajority. And the supermajority, we're talking of a minimum of two-thirds. And from the 349, we must have 233. I've had members talking of the public talking about this issue like in, uh, in Wasingishu and the reporter Wanyama. I want to correct and say it is not just National Assembly, it is Parliament. When you talk of Parliament, it's the two chambers. That is the Senate and the National Assembly. And for this two-third gender rule to pass, it must go to both chambers. That's the National Assembly and the Senate. And as we speak right now, there's a life bill in the Senate. It might be an opportunity. Let's wait for it to come to the National Assembly because we'll pass it. And Duale can also have another bill. Why not? So there's still time. We can make another attempt. But I want to say that it's not been that easy. If it's been difficult to achieve two third gender in appointing, it's not going to be that easy when it comes to the, to the elective uh, seats. Even if parliament is dissolved, how sure are you that the other parliament that will come will even achieve the current 22%? So unless you have amended laws, the Elections Act, the Political Parties Act, the IPC Act, the Campaign Financing Act, to be able to put some framework in place is when maybe you can be assured of this two-third gender. And if at all we're not going to be able to pass it, I think PBI should recommend if you go for a referendum and even remove that clause of the two-third gender. Even if you look at the mature democracies in America, go to UK, wherever, there's no way in the world they've achieved two-third gender. But we are told it has come in through maybe nominations. It is something very difficult. Kenyans have a right to vote for anybody of their wish. You can't go and dictate to Kenyans that you must vote for a woman to do it here and there. If we, if we are going to borrow, let's say, Article 177, the way it's been done in the counter assemblies, if we come to the National Assembly, we say that uh, the shortage can be nominated. We don't have any sitting positions. We need to know. We need to understand the reality here. So it's upon the Kenyans to make a decision. Women are fighting for their own rights, yes. We do support them. So far, we've done very well progressively. We have about 22%. So let's see in the next election how many women are going to be, to be elected. It's not an easy issue, Trevor. But so, as the current 12th parliament, yeah. we are very committed. And any other bill, when it comes, I can assure you some of us are still going to support that to that gender. We are requesting a Honda Boduale to come up with another Duale, another Duale bill as we wait for the other one coming from the Senate. But isn't that, isn't that close to what Honorable Moses Kuria is saying, in as much as you say that it is, you're not him, obviously? He says which constituencies then will be for men, and at the same time it raises the question you had earlier on raised, that then how can the will of the people to elect their representatives democratically under Article 1 of the Constitution be negated simply because we are looking for a two-thirds gender rule? Because even if the 290 constituencies people will vote again, they might even elect more men. Then what happens? Absolutely. That's why I mentioned the issue of, uh, like, what happened in Article 177 of the counter assemblies. You know, the counter assemblies have managed to get this to that gender. When the elections have been done, they do the tabulation and see what is the shortfall to make the two thirds, the two third gender. 
then this is achieved through the nomination. So if we borrow from Article 177 and apply it at the National Assembly and the Senate, maybe it can be achievable. But as I said earlier, let's wait for the BBI report. Some of us gave our, gave our recommendations in the BBI committee, and I have no doubt that if this BBI report is going to be released, the issue of two-thirds gender is going to be addressed. And if, it, if at all it calls for a referendum, let it be, so that we can achieve this once and for all. Okay. Do we have Joy? Let's, let's bring in Joy Mudivo back on this. You see, the, the, the issue is this. Yeah. When we do not have a formula to help us in the, the gender parity rule, then when you go for an election, of course, you will not attain the numbers. And that is why in the Senate and in the county assembly, in the National Assembly, whatever is not attained in elective, yes, whatever is not attained in the elective process, if we just look at it in terms of what we have currently, it will like uh, on where will people sit becomes a problem. And that is why different formulas have been suggested. Mixed member proportional representation has been suggested. We suggested a reversion back to the 210 constituencies and then now the extra to uh, 80 seats to be the ones for nomination. It's upon the National Assembly to now be serious about considering them because because the failure is not for Kenyans to elect according to the, the gender rule. The failure is for the National Assembly to pass a law to actually ensure that what is not attained in the elective process is so that women constituencies, as if having a woman for a leader is such a tragedy, but that argument is actually, it's patriarchal. It is, it's actually condescending towards women leadership. And it's not fair at all. Okay. Honorable Malwa, you know, in the papers I see here, they're saying that the big three are silent. That is, uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Raila Odinga, the president himself, Uru Kenyatta. In fact, yesterday he spoke but did not touch on this. The Deputy President William Ruto is also silent on this issue. Politically speaking, now that you're the one who's in the political circles, what does dissolving parliament who does dissolving parliament advantage out of all the three of them who is most likely to benefit the most if parliament is dissolved in fact if parliament is dissolved none will gain right now we've talked of reforms and these reforms can only be achieved if parliament is in existence and i want to take you down the memory lane last time we were voting on the two-third gender his Excellency President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta gave a directive, requested his Jubilee members to be there and support the two-third gender. Prime Minister Raila Molo Dinga was actually in parliament. He came in parliament in person to see that this two-third gender rule goes through. The Deputy President William Samoy Ruto, he was been on record supporting the issue of the two-third gender. So when you talk about the big three, as far as I'm concerned, all the big three have been supporting the two-third gender rule. And if parliament is dissolved for now, it is going to be anarchy. It will not be favorable even to you. Even the women, wherever they are, anybody that is advocating for this, it is not going to be the same. Even the judiciary. Judiciary can only get their budgets if parliament has done the approval. In the absence of parliament, Parliament is a budget-making house. So when Parliament is dissolved, it is going to be a crisis. And that's why I was asking the Chief Justice, what was his intention? To throw the country into constitutional crisis when he has gone into retirement? What was the intention? And I have no doubt that His Excellency President Uhuru Migai Kenyatta cannot dissolve Parliament. He knows the repercussions. If you do a cost-benefit analysis, I'll tell you for free, you can only dissolve this parliament if we are ready to go for elections in 2022. IBC is the only body that conducts elections. As we speak right now, IBC is not well constituted. Who is to constitute IBC? It is parliament. Who is to give money in terms of budget? It is parliament. You can't work without parliament. 
So for somebody to think that the parliament can be dissolved, this country, it will be very chaotic. It is totally, practically impossible. Even yeah. Justice Korir, because the hearing is coming on 7th, that is next week, as he'll be doing that, uh, the hearing before he makes a determination, he must do a cost-benefit analysis. How practical is it? You must look at the issue of practicability. Look at the country where we are at Trevor. We still have a lot of easy issues of corona. The positivity rate, I've seen it started increasing. The virus is there. We can't run away from the reality. So as you make your determination, you must look at the reality in this country. Parliament is not going, on, it's not going away. The three arms of government, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive, the three can only work together for this country to survive. Okay. So that, that advisory to me, it was ill advice, premature, and in bad faith. And okay. I'm so sorry for Justice, uh, Chief Justice, because I was on the floor of the House when he was being vetted. We even mentioned this David who is going to hit Collier. The issues of corruption, everything. But he has disappointed us on this advisory. All I right. Thank you. Joy, finally, is there any no, other way I, we can achieve this two-thirds gender rule now that this one seems to be a bit shifty? Or is it just a matter of lack of political goodwill? No, like I said before, there are various proposals that have been made. So first and foremost, if we look at our current situation, if we decide, for example, that we are going to revert the two ten constituencies, we can use the 80 for nominations to bridge whatever gender gap is left in the elections. Or you could decide to go 50-50 and use the county as the basic structure of election and do away with the constituencies, such that in every county, we say every county will give us, let's say, based on population, let's say six members of parliament. So three men, three women. So that will be achieving even 50-50 rather than even talking about two-thirds. It's very difficult to get a third of anything. It's very difficult mathematics. Or we can go for mixed member proportional representation where we elect parties and in the party list they have a zebra nomination such that if you give a odm 60 seats in their nomination they have got uh, the zebra so that way you get 30 men 30 women so there are ways this has been achieved in other jurisdictions it's not impossible as uh, honorable amalo would have us think it's not impossible to attain it but be that as it may there's a point i need to make he talks about the practicality they live in kenya they need to understand one of the things that parliament and Kenyans need to understand is that the courts rule on the law. They interpret the law and they give a ruling based on what the law says. They don't have to look at the practicality of the situation. That's for the politicians to look at and for the rest of us to worry about. But they need to pronounce themselves on the law. And on this particular instance, I think uh, even when Judge Korir is ruling on this, he has to look at the black letter of the law because this is going down in Posterity, this is forming precedent of how we are going to deal with the issue in future. So is this attainable? They have about 90 days to 120 days tops to actually remedy this. They can do this. And right now, the country is easing the corona restrictions. So before long, they should be able to have full sittings of the house. Let them just put the, the elbow grease on and just get this done. Because if they okay. don't pass this bill, it's not going away. The women fought for this to be included in the Constitution, and we are not going to let it go because one time it will be the men needing affirmative action. Okay. So we are doing this also not for ourselves, yeah. but for posterity. All right. Honorable Malwa, having been jolted by this move by the <laughs> CJ, do you now think that when the next time the debate comes up, it will pass? First and foremost, as uh, what Joy had said, the issue is to put a formula, a framework to be able to achieve that. And for that framework to succeed, it will involve amending other laws, related laws, like the Elections Act, Political Parties Act, the ITC Act, yeah, and all that. But one them. of the recommendations, but one, but one of the recommendations that are, that are in Parliament is uh, they want to reserve some specific constituencies to be reserved for women. The question is, for instance, I'm a member of Parliament of Kimini, and you come and say, in 2022, Kimini must only elect a woman. That contravenes the rights of a citizen, because he has a right to vote for any gender he feels like. Those are some of the proposals that are on, on the floor. But are they practical? Or you go today, you decide, 
I want a constituency, let's say, like, uh, like in Nairobi, we say Kibra. Nobody should go to Kibra as a man. It is reserved for a woman. Nobody should go to Kimini. It should be reserved for a, a woman. You'll be contravening the, the rights of those voters in Kimini. They have a right to vote for a man or a woman. But in case there's a shortfall, as far as the two third gender is concerned, maybe this can be done through the nomination process, the way it's being done in the county assembly. And I think that can be acceptable. I have no doubt that the BBI report, if you allow it to come out, it has some of these good solutions. So his excellency the president, please, let's get the BBI report. It might provide a solution. But I want to tell you, Trevor, if this matter comes to the floor of the house, parliament, parliamentarians will pronounce themselves. I don't want to, to say what is gonna be the results, but once we have the, the minimum threshold of 233 members of parliament, me personally, as a member of parliament for community constituency, I've been supporting this. I don't know what Moses Kuria will say, but the proposals Joe is giving of these issues of mapping the zebra and all that, some of them are not practical. You cannot go to Katundu or you go to Kimini and tell the people of Kimini that 2022 don't vote for a man, okay. vote for a woman. Of course, Chris Omar will not be there. I'll All be right. going for governor of Transoya County. Okay. But they should have they should have a choice whether they want a man or a woman. All right. Mwishmiwa, thank you so much for making time for us. Honorable Chris Omalo, member thank of you. Parliament Kiminini, and Joy Mudivo, former magistrate and also a lawyer right now, and Steve O'Gall, advocate of the High Court, who was speaking to us earlier on. Thank you so much, and thank you for taking part in this discussion. Believe me, for the rest of the week, this is the only thing everyone is going to talk about, and back to school as well, right? But for now, we're taking a quick break here on Daybreak. When you come back, it's workout using kitchen utensils. Can you believe it? We'll see in just a bit. <laughs>